Welcome back to American Republic. Uh, we have begun talking about the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower. I mentioned that he was able to win the election in 1952 and 56, that he undertook the St. Lawrence Seaway Project, as well as the Federal Aid Highway Act, along with the fact that Alaska and Hawaii became states. Now let's talk about what foreign policy he's going to have to face. Why did the U.S., you know, we've, we've been discussing this entire chapter about how the U.S. has been getting involved in other countries' affairs. Why did the United States care about politics in Eastern Europe, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Japan, China, Korea, Southeast Asia, the Soviet Union, and Cuba? Well, the world changed a great deal after World War II. Democracy was engaged in a worldwide struggle against a foe whose primary purpose was to wipe out democracy and free enterprise. The whole free world looked to America for help and guidance. Much of the rest of the world plotted against America. Well, what kind of lessons can we learn from the Cold War and apply to us today? Well, other countries still see the United States as either a friend or a foe. For example, many of the Islamic countries of the world see the United States. They literally refer to us as the great Satan and are willing to support terrorism to defeat the entire Western world. We as Christians need to make sure that we are responsible U.S. citizens and that we pray for our leaders in dealing with these real problems today. When Eisenhower became president, he faced a different kind of tyranny than he had faced during World War II. Communism was expanding in Europe, Cuba, China, and Southeast Asia. So let's start with Southeast Asia. Indochina, which is modern-day Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, became a target of communism. It had been a French colony, but after World War II, French control in the region deteriorated. Communist Ho Chi Minh overthrew French forces in Vietnam. An international conference was held in Geneva, Switzerland to resolve the conflict. The, the result was a communist North Vietnam and a free South Vietnam. Oh, and by the way, North Vietnam decided to attack South Vietnam. Uh, sounds like the same song, second verse. Sound like we've heard this all before. The communists wanted all of Vietnam. Conventional armies and guerrilla forces moved across the border to disrupt South Vietnam. Before long, the U.S. discovered that China and the Soviet Union were also giving military aid to the North Vietnamese. To counteract this, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO, pledged to aid any member nation that was threatened and the U.S began sending military advisors to South Vietnam to train Vietnamese forces. The Seattle members included Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Pakistan, the Philippines, Britain, France, and the U.S. Uh, by sending these military advisors to Vietnam, America is going to take its first step, unfortunately, in becoming stuck in what will become known as the Vietnam War. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time this year to talk about it. If you want to look into it in more detail, you can read the next chapter in the book. Number two, the Soviet Union. Attempts were made at this time to ease the tension between the U.S. and the USSR. In 1955, Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the U.S. met in Geneva to relieve that tension. Unfortunately, about the only thing they agreed on was that they would not resort to war to resolve differences. Maybe one of the reasons why uh, the Soviet Union seemed more open to peace was because of a new leader in the Soviet Union. Uh, Joseph Stalin had died in 1953, and a man by the name of Nikita Khrushchev had become the new Soviet leader. Khrushchev claimed to be critical of Stalin's terrorist tactics. He declared that the Soviets wanted to be friends and promote peace with the U.S. Yet, Soviet intentions had not changed. They still remained clouded to the rest of us. For example, Khrushchev had also said to the U.S. that we will better you. So, doesn't sound like a very peaceful, promising conversation. 
the two countries made efforts at peaceful coexistence, trying to settle disputes without hostility. They also arranged events to promote goodwill between them. For example, in 1959, Khrushchev made this first Soviet or became the first Soviet leader to visit the U.S. Unfortunately, the principle of peaceful coexistence committed the U.S. to settling each issue peacefully, even if Soviet wrongs were not stopped or punished. In your books, turn to page 490, and please read the small pink box entitled Khrushchev's Visit to the Farm. Once you have finished reading that box, please unpause the video, and we will continue. Number three. Europe. Soviet oppression continued in Eastern Europe. People in the Soviet satellites were unhappy under communist rule. And in 1956, one of those communist countries decided to fight back. Freedom fighters in Hungary, hoping for U.S. assistance, assistance revolted against Soviet control. Unfortunately, none came and it failed. Using shortwave radio broadcasts, they pleaded for help from the West, but none came. For four days, the Hungarians continued to hope, but Soviet troops with tanks invaded and crushed the revolt. The UN condemned the Soviets' invasion of Hungary, but took no real action, strengthening the Soviets' belief that the free world would, be, would do nothing to interfere. Number four. Cuba. Among Latin America's poor and uneducated, communism grew in popularity as they believed communism's promises of a better life. The growth of communism in Latin America alarmed Americans because it brought the Soviet threat to the very doorstep of the U.S. In 1959, communist Fidel Castro took over Cuba and allied himself with the Soviets. Castro was a cruel dictator. He jailed thousands of his political enemies. He seized private property, including that of Americans and American businesses in Cuba. In fact, he even seized his own mother's property. Cuban refugees tried to escape C Castro's regime by fleeing to Florida any way they could. Some flew on airplanes. Most floated on rickety boats. The Caribbean was no longer an American lake. Ninety miles from Florida lay a communist threat to American freedom. Letter C, the election of 1960. Uh, Eisenhower serves two terms as president, and according to the new law, that's as long as he is allowed to serve. And so now we have an election with two new individuals. The Republican candidate was Richard Nixon. Remember, we've talked about Richard Nixon some. Uh, he, he fought communism during the, uh, the, the Red Scare situation. Uh, he was also the vice president of Eisenhower. The Democrats went with a man by the name of John F. Kennedy. Kennedy uh, had served in World War II, so had Nixon. Uh, Kennedy was also a Massachusetts senator, his running mate was the Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson of Texas. Democrats hoped to unite Northern and Southern Democrats with this ticket. For the first time in history, the candidates participated in a series of televised debates. JFK entered the debates as an underdog. He was less well-known as Nixon. But his youthful appearance and charm produced good results. In contrast, Nixon seemed to lack energy and appeal. He refused to use studio makeup and looked unshaven. Those who listened to the debates on the radio thought Nixon had won. Those watching the debates thought Kennedy the winner. Goes to show how influential television can be all because of the way people look on it. On page 492, there is a map showing you the election of 1960. You can see it's a very mixed election result. Most of the West went to Nixon. 
Most of the east went to Kennedy, and then the states in the middle, uh, you can see, being divided up as well. In the end, Kennedy wins. The election was extremely close. Of the 68.3 million votes cast, Kennedy won by only about 120,000. You say, well, that's still a lot of people. Well, 120,000 is a difference of less than one vote per precinct. Had one voter in each precinct changed their vote to Nixon, Nixon would have won the popular vote and possibly would have won the election. John F. Kennedy is now the first president born in the 20th century. He's also the first president who is an avowed Catholic uh, to be president of the United States. During his inaugural address, he gives this famous phrase, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And in this inaugural address, he challenged Americans to do this. He'll also challenge and ask America's enemies to join the U.S. in a quest for lasting peace. That's all the material that we're going to cover for today. We've got one more video in store for you. Hope you all have a good rest of the day. Be good, do good. Bye.